Hello and welcome to another episode of Good for Profit. This is your host Mo and this is the podcast where we speak with entrepreneurs, founders, startup leaders and investors who are building businesses that are both profitable and good for the world. Today's guest is Louis Barnett, founder at Ikigai Studio. Louis is an incredibly interesting character. He's somebody who was diagnosed with a lot of learning disabilities at a very early age which led to him being chucked into the deep end of business. From around the age of 11, he's had to do a lot of speaking uh, in front of big crowds and so on. And honestly, the journey for the whole way, so many insights along the way, obviously lots of ups and downs. And Louis, I'm so grateful for it, was so open and honest throughout this whole conversation, but also very inspiring and very engaging. I think it has something to do with the fact that he's been talking to audiences for a very long time. I personally enjoyed the conversation thoroughly. We discussed all things to do with business, his exit from the previous business, his current thing that he's working on and so on. Um, and there were just tons of t- key takeaways from, from me, a lot of book recommendations and so on, of course. Um, but yeah, I don't want to give away too much. So I'm going to leave you to it. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Here is the conversation with Louis. It ha- it is, I know he's been busy. We've been uh, sort of back and forth talking, trying to get hold of each other. And you do this thing where you use Loom to uh, send messages. I, love, I loved it. I'd never done that before. Yeah, I, I just, I find actually you can send a Loom as just as easily and quickly as an email. But I think it's, you know, I'm obviously I'm a psychology nerd. So I think a little bit of facial interaction and body language is something we lose in, in email. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I love Loom. Big fan. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I mean, you've introduced me to it now. So I received that LinkedIn message from you and I thought, you know what, that's it. I'm going to try it back. And I tried it and I thought it was fantastic. Awesome. So I think we're going to go from there. Uh, they're not sponsoring this podcast, but maybe this could be the... Uh, yeah, definitely, the mate. I think they should. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> so where are you so I'm in Shrewsbury. Today? So uh, west of Birmingham, Welsh border, nice little market town, very quiet. But um, yeah, it's, it's a good good place to be close to the countryside in Wales. It's just very far away from most other civilizations. So pros and cons. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you can't get everything in the same, in one place, I suppose, but probably as close to it as you can be. I mean, uh, what's the, the drive for you to Cardiff or to Bristol? Or um, like Bristol's probably just two and a half hours away or so um london's a bit of a pain so i yeah i drove oh wow yeah oh, yeah yeah north. yeah so oh, okay. i drove what okay. well, yeah i drove geography. to london uh this week and it's four hours down three and a half hours back so so it's a little bit far but you know wow yeah i'm checking it on the map now i think the first time we ever spoke i checked it on the map and now I'm checking Shrewsbury on the map again. Uh, you so Birmingham is essentially your uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, to... yeah, got it. My my geography <laughs> is so bad. I uh, I started playing an online game uh, that literally is to do, all to do with. Uh, I mean, it's kind of sad, but it's word domination. So it's a world domination game that requires you to understand all the different countries in the world, and and it's it, it's quite it's quite smart in the way that it works. But the primary reason why I started to play it, I mean, it is a lot of fun, obviously, but the primary reason was just to get better at geography because <laughs> I suck at maps. I suck at knowing where I, things are. Uh, so even countries and like, you know, where they are. That's cool, the world, mate. So. No, I mean, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I've been better with geography because I've done a bit of traveling and stuff. But I, I think that it's so easy to be ignorant of so many, especially kind of small, slightly unknown countries. And, and I think kind of for me, the eastern part of Europe if somebody asked me to actually draw it on a map, I'm, I'm not sure I'll be able to. So, um, yeah, you'll have to send me an invite to the game. I could do with brushing up on mine. Absolutely. Come and join us, my friend. We've uh, created the Intergalactic uh, Very Council cool. on there. Uh, me, me and my co-founder, my co-founder joined me for a bit as well. <laughs> <laughs> it was a team building experience. Very cool. That's what it was. So it was great. But, yeah. Uh, Louis, thanks for making time for this, man. I've been wanting to talk to you on here. Uh, we got, only got introduced fairly recently, but ever since that first conversation we had together, I sort of knew that you know we, we need to have a, a deeper dive, a deeper chat together. And it's always great that we've, we've got the opportunity to do this on here because you know we, we can talk deeply about quite a few different things, uh, but also some listeners might find this interesting. So why not? Obviously, you're now you know well into the world of business. Uh, you've you've been running uh, Ikigai Studio for a little while. 
you've been doing a lot of speaking and and just your own stuff for a long time now for many many years almost two decades right uh if not more even and um it seems to me like sort of your route into the professional world was a little bit different a little bit of an untraditional route compared to sort of you know you didn't do the typical whatever study go to uni graduate graduate scheme go to a consulting whatever and then go into startups it was a bit of a non-traditional route can you maybe just talk us a little, little bit more through that tell us a bit more about it and how that kind of worked out for you. yeah cool mate so i mean it's it's a long story i'll try and condense as much of it as i can but um i was really not a happy school kid really struggled through school never understood why my sort of work seemed to be in a different language just couldn't grasp it you know it was not academic and it got to the point you know on and on I got to about 10 10 years old coming up to my year six sats and the teacher kind of said look he's basically to my parents he's not going to make it through ended up meeting a local tutor literally first lesson she said I think Louis got sort of um, special needs uh, as they were once deemed back then educational disabilities And so obviously it's, you know, it's a hard thing, I think, to hear as a kid, but also as my parents, they went away, got an educational psychologist. And when I was 11, I was diagnosed with dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, short term memory loss syndrome, ADHD and autism, which I think for a brief moment, you kind of think, oh, life's over. That's it. I'm a moron, never going to be able to do anything. And I think I was really lucky that this tutor reflected back at me and said, hey, look, there are all these super successful people around the world that have got similar things that that you have. You know, there's Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And, you know, she gave me this this big sort of sheet of all these people and Sir Richard Branson and, and all of these different people. So I think it was very short lived for me because I sort of went, OK, maybe I'm not completely screwed. Maybe there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Went back to school, did my year six, that's just about. Um, and then kind of bullying and various other things escalated as I went into high school. And the school that I was at was a kind of catchment area school. I was from a tiny little village in the West Midlands and only school in the area. So they, I, I was at high school for six weeks and two kids got stabbed. So I get it. The teachers were much more concerned about wow. like safety of students right then kind of special educational needs and this was at a time 2003 where these kind of things were not as well known so basically it just got to a point my parents hadn't got the money Mm. to send me to a private school and so there wasn't really any other option on the table other than to home educate it was quite a weird move I think for all of us it was weird for me I think in the sense I always say to people at some point I got it earlier than most, but you have this unplugged moment where your life feels like everything's been planned out for you step by step. And then suddenly somebody unplugs you and it's like, okay, you're on your own now. So I just think I got that earlier than than most people do. And so then I think earlier I started to think yeah. about what do I actually enjoy? What do I want to do? I'd always really been into kind of cooking and food, you know, cook with my mom on the kitchen table and stuff ever since I was a little tot. Love chocolate. And so I ended up kind of drifting into various things. The, the first thing I actually ended up doing was working at a falconry center. So working with birds of prey, um, both UK and international birds of prey, oh, wow. which was, it was a pretty interesting experience. I've always had a great love of animals, but I was actually at the time I'm, Uh, it was great fun really really cool but I think unbeknown to me and at the time I really didn't appreciate it but the guy who ran the center had absolutely no clue what an 11 year old I think should or shouldn't be doing and unbeknown to him at the time I think I recognized it later that he was really neurodiverse hated people loved animals as a lot of people in the animal world mm. do and so he shoved me into doing all of these jobs that basically he didn't want to do which was everything from you know invoicing and talking to suppliers you know customers we used to do a lot of bird prey like training and experience days and he just kind of shoved me into the room with all these adults and kind of go oh, you look after them and so it, oh it yeah, wow. which, you know, at the time I was this very introverted, very shy, way, yeah, you know, kid and being shoved into all these environments. And then we used to do bird of prey displays. 
And so I was kind of, you know, the backup, used to run around and pass him stuff. And then one day we were doing this event at a big uh, zoo in the UK. One of the birds flew off. He just handed me the mic and went, get on with it. And so actually, you know, kind of baptism of fire, probably only like 100 people in front of me, but I just had to muddle through. And he was then hiding around the corner, came back and said, oh, you did a great job. You can do more of that now. So again, I actually ended up being dropped into public speaking without having any inclination of wanting to do it, but just being kind of forced to do it. And over time, got pretty comfortable with it. An 11-year-old as well at the same time. So. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I, my claim to fame is that at 11 years old, my biggest um, audience was 1,200 people, and it was a Formula One components company in the north of London. So, you know, it was, as I said, at the time, oh, it wow. was... Uh, uh, so it was it was a yeah it was a formula one components company they're an italian um components company and we did this big corporate day and john the the guy around the center literally just handed me the microphone and was like oh you do this i really don't want to do this one so um you know really good life skills but as i said had no there was no kind of path laid out it was just one thing to the other and then i ended up buying a book happens Mm -hmm. chance end of a shelf cookery book on chocolate got into making cakes and chocolates and it was around the time that chocolates were only really just kind of coming into the UK from Europe Belgian chocolates were sort of appearing more in kind of key retail stores I suppose and I'd always been a massive chocolate fan and so I started making chocolates you know cakes family and friends and it really just snowballed I think because I lived in a little village you know, word spread pretty quickly. I got more and more orders, ended up supplying a couple of local restaurants in Delhi, ended up going into my local Waitrose store, giving them some samples, became their youngest ever supplier. A year later, Sainsbury's youngest ever supplier. A year later, Selfridges moved into a production unit in Shropshire, started producing. And in 2007, I delivered 165 chocolate boxes in the January by the December of the same year, I delivered 100,000, got onto some major kind of TV channels. That is nuts, bro. Yeah. I, and, and how old were you during the time? So like around this period? between 14 and 15. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't... Gosh, I'm, I'm trying to think back to what I was doing when <laughs> I was uh, 14 and 15, 15 years old. I wouldn't ever do it again. Uh, I, I, the, obviously, this isn't a, a comparison thing, but... But yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, that's, it's a lot of, you were chucked into a lot of responsibility very, very early on. Um, and you know, I mean, it, it's a lot for, for a kid to handle, but it sounds like you handled it and in a way it served you really well, but it also must've been really hard to go through, to go through that. Maybe it didn't feel like it at the time, maybe it did, but you know, it, it sounds, yeah, it, it sounds like there is kind of, I'm struggling to, to, I'm struggling to make a complete judgment as to whether it was a good thing or a bad thing if you know what i mean i yeah i mean i think completely it, i think it was mixed because i think that on the one hand i had to grow up really really quickly and had to deal with a lot of responsibility and learn really quickly and i think also what was interesting is that around that time young entrepreneurs weren't really a thing so i was going into a lot of meetings with guys that were you know three four times my age and so what that meant was that initially there's a kind of, oh, this is gimmicky. This is kind of just a thing that his parents have kind of made him do. And then I had to then persuade them that, no, no, this mm. is this is my thing. This is my company. And so that that was tough. But I think that it gave me, you know, it, mm. it toughened me up, I think, a lot quite quickly. But it also made me strive more because I did have a lot of adults kind of looking down at me like, oh, this Mm. is just some gimmicky thing. So I think I think that in a way was good for me because then it gave me that drive and like, okay, I want to prove something to the world that I'm actually this isn't just some PR stunt, you know, that I do actually know what I'm doing. So I I think that was tough at the responsibility. I mean, I had 10 staff you know, employing people that are older than you is a very unusual thing when, especially when you're that age, you know, you, you're, mm. you're a teenager and then all of the PR that happened. I've... It's, it's unusual enough when you're in your twenties 
like even early to mid twenties is unusual enough, let alone if you're if you're that young. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, and and then suddenly all this PR started to happen. First, it was BBC Breakfast Live News, and then it was just I got featured in thirty five different countries over the space of like six months. It was a really bizarre time where it was like me little life you know bridge north shropshire little market town you know small world okay i'd I'd got sainsbury's and waitrose at this point but still didn't quite feel real and then suddenly it's like oh now you're getting pr every major newspaper you know a couple of like cover pieces and it was just a really bizarre thing to happen but I think that's also when I, I mean, I got called an entrepreneur the first time and had to look the term up. because so I was like, I, I don't know what this is. So it, it was definitely, you know, I always say to people, I, I'm, I was an entrepreneur by default. I found something that I enjoyed. I, I went to seek it out and ended up developing a business, which, you know, I don't know, there's pros and cons to that. I think the pro, the pro was that I did it out of pure passion and love and the business mm. came later. So I, th- I think, yeah, I had to learn a lot very quickly. And then as, as the business progressed, I think one of the things that became apparent was a lot of small businesses end up in this cycle is that they're just purely reactive. There's no kind of proactive. There's a plan. There's a strategy. There's a thought process. And so I think that was quite a big lesson to learn early on of like, OK, we've spent a couple of years. There's all this stuff going on. It's pretty chaotic. And I was then lucky to meet a couple of people that tapped me on the shoulder and kind of went, look, there's people that have done this before you. So maybe you should kind of listen to some, you know, age old wisdom. And um, I was kind of lucky to get some mentors early on. And, you know, the, the business progressed really well. I ended up growing it to exporting 17 countries around the world, spent a lot of time out in the UK and kind of ended up as the business went on wearing a couple of different hats of like the entrepreneur talking about a, as a young entrepreneur business and how to grow a business and consumer psychology became a, a real specialty subject for me. And then whilst also trying to run the chocolate business. So that was 11 years. So started it in 2004, exited in 2015 and ended up then really nicely drifting into kind of consultancy growth hacking and speaking. So that's a a very quick summary of the last 18 or 19 years or so now. That's that sounds incredible. You say you drifted uh, quite nicely into speaking. It sounds like you you know you were more chucked into speaking quite early yeah. on and then and then just kind of kept going with it from there. Um that that's uh, what an incredible story it's, it's always very inspirational when you hear um somebody being dealt what what could have been quite a quite what was undeniably a tough hand um but just turning it around and doing something with it and a lot a lot of people i speak with uh they sort of don't give themselves enough credit around that they sort of, sort of just say well you know it toughened me up and it was great for me but but the reality is that also you kind of you know you 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 your past your kid version of you uh, was wise enough and strong enough to, to take that and turn it into something incredible. So that, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing, man. Um, so you moved that on from the chocolate business into, uh, by the way, can I, can I buy these chocolates somewhere still? Did, are they still being sold in, in different They're places? They're not, Mo, no. What, with the exit? Did they kind of... No, so I, basically I, I, I made a good and a, Sorry to hear. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I made a good and a bad decision in the sense that when I was 21, I decided to change the name of the brand from chocolate into Louis Barnett chocolates. And so, you know, good in the sense that the brand had all been about me and, you know, I'd learned pretty early on about sort of brand psychology and that actually the closer you get to being human, the more connectivity you you have with customers. So that, that was, I think a good choice, but the bad choice was when I then decided in 2012 to kind of make that progress to exit the issue was that the brand was my name. And so what ended up happening was that there were, you know, there were people interested in buying, but the only one that was really interested and had the right money at the time ended up basically being one of the biggest palm oil users in the world. I found that out later on in the discussions where the kind of investment money was coming from. Mm -hmm. And I'd spent my whole career campaigning against palm oil. So I I basically just decided that I wasn't going to find somebody that was going to buy the brand 
take it forwards, run it in the way that I'd want to run it. And they were offering me a lot of money, but, you know, I, I was lucky to have some mentors sort of go, look, Louis, you're like, you know, you, you're 21, 22, when this is all, the, these discussions are starting to happen. You don't want to make a decision that you're going to regret for the next 50 years. So you, you've got to, you know, choose wisely. And so I ended up selling off parts of the company and we did a lot of white label work. So that went and machinery and, you know, manufacturing sites okay. and stuff. But the, the brand itself, I kind of unfortunately just had to close down. Um, I mean, I think that's, there's a long discussion there about, you know, the chocolate industry is an incredibly tough industry to be in. Um, it's really tough now. You know, the margins are infinitesimally small and the market space is so competitive it's like the olympics you know so i think i got out at the perfect time wow. cut my teeth learned a lot um but uh i think it all kind of happened as as it was meant to and, and actually i'm glad that i didn't end up with a big check because i think i'd have probably gone off the rails a little bit at that point i was still you know in my early 20s so still learning a lot about myself and the world and so i'm, I'm kind of glad that things happened the way that they did Ferraris and trips to the wherever. Uh, uh, do you think you're gonna fall into that trap, or do you think you're uh, wise enough not to? I no. How no you got in the big money. Not at all. No, I think I think one of the biggest things. I mean, I, so I don't drink now at all, but I think that I got brought up around a lot of friends and sort of family and stuff that drank a lot, and so I think that was probably a vice that I, I'm really glad that I didn't have that much money to to really because i'm i'm sure i'd have ended up with a quite serious issue um and i decided to kind of stop drinking before it ever became a, a serious problem but yeah i mean i think this is it you know you see a lot of young people kind of music stars or, or business people or, or influencers you know and you see suddenly they get all of this money and i think it's very hard to stay grounded you know very difficult so yeah i, I kind of I'm in my thirties now and I'm kind of like, yeah, at the time I was really disappointed that it, the deal didn't really happen. But looking back now, I'm like, actually it's, it was the best thing for future me, but not necessarily me at that time. Sure. Yeah, of course. Well, but you, I'm always a big believer in, you know, doing what your future self will thank you for. So I suppose you can now look back and say, well, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy that happened and I'm happy it went that way, but seriously, good on you for sticking to your principles and, um, you know, not taking the money because it effectively not selling your soul to the devil, uh, because the deal was on the table. We decided, okay, I'm campaigning against this. I'm going to stick to my principles. I'm not going to go with that. So really good on you for that. That that's uh, very inspiring Thank you, to mate. see. Um, so then, okay. So you moved on from that onto, uh, consulting and onto Ikigai studios. Um, can you tell our listeners a bit more about that? Cause, uh, for the name of the, the name of the company itself was actually one of the very first thing that caught my eyes about you. So. A uh, friend of ours, mutual friend of ours, uh, Adam introduced introduced us to one another. Uh, and uh, when he mentioned you and mentioned the name of your company, I was like, oh, okay, That's, that sounds really cool. Sounds like a cool, a cool fella. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about that, my friend? Yeah, sure. So I, um, the consultancy stuff had been happening since 2008. So I, you know, I got my first consultancy job in a Michelin guide Indian restaurant in kind of food, bev, hospitality. And as as time progressed, I ended up picking more and more and more consultancy work up as as time went on. So yeah, you know, got got this job at a Michelin Guide Indian restaurant, and it got really thrown, I think, into the deep end with consultancy because of the PR and everything that had been happening and the speaking. But I think quite quickly realised that actually my business and the circumstances behind my business and my early life had given me quite a I think a depth and a breadth of skill set you know being an MD I think you learn a lot as as you know my you know being a founder you, you become a juggler right you're juggling 25 30 different balls all at once it's HR and people management and sales and marketing and branding and all of these different things and I think as well for me coming from you know, a manufacturing background as well, you learn a lot about process and efficiency. So, you know, I went into some jobs, did did really well. And then the consultancy just kind of grew. And the more I was doing speaking, the more I'd end, end up being asked to go in and consult with different companies. And, you know, everything from really, really small, you know, kind of micro and SMEs, all the way up to, you know, 
big corporate businesses. And so as the years went on, I think it, it was just a really natural trans transition for me to move from one in to the other. And what I kind of noticed was that towards the end of the chocolate business, you know, I was actually getting paid more per hour. Um, I know you shouldn't really look at your time like that, but, you know, from a kind of basic point of view, doing the consultancy and growth hacking than I was in the chocolate business. So I, I think it just got to a point where I was like, I just don't feel like the chocolate yeah. business is really going to go where I want it to go. And so this feels like the next natural it, step. It was a profitable business though, right? So that again, sorry, Mo. The Can you hear me? I can now, yeah. Uh, the, the chocolate business was a profitable business. Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> there, there's a huge delay. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start again. So uh, the chocolate business was a profitable business though, right? But none, the, I know you mentioned earlier on that, you know, the sort of uh, margins can be quite low and very tough within the FMB. But it, it was, it, you were in the green, you were kind of, sustainably running that business right but you still weren't able to pay yourself a, a good enough salary in the sure i mean and i think as well that the issue with the business is that you know the, the just the margins were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and, and you sort of get to a point where you you're like yes we're profitable but at such a, a low level compared to what we're actually doing you know I'd, I'd go we did a lot through qvc and online sort of retailers and stuff and you know i'd, I'd go and we'd do these great shows and we'd move 30 40 grand's worth of product but you know literally making a couple of percent on it and and i think this is very true you know in fact i spoke to somebody else in the chocolate industry who had one of the biggest um lollipop and kind of um shell manufacturing companies in the uk ch chocolate wise and they were making about three or four pence profit per item and and i think that you know that the thing is that people don't really realize about the chocolate business is when i first started buying chocolate we were paying about sort of 1200 1300 pound a ton some something like that i mean even when i very first started it's like eight nine hundred quid a ton to buy the same quality of chocolate today, you'd easily be paying six and a half to eight and a half thousand pounds a ton. So the price of chocolate has, Whoa, yeah, that is a huge absolutely. Difference. The price of chocolate has absolutely skyrocketed, but the price that the average consumer is paying hasn't really increased that much. I mean, it, like if you look at Lint as an example, uh, I'm not going to go into the ethics of big chocolate manufacturers on this chat, but they're, you know, retail price point is probably 20% higher than it was 10 years ago. Um, and you really have to ask yourself, like, how are they doing that? I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But you know, really, the, this was the discussion. And what I realized was, if you really want to, you can, by the way, well, I mean, yeah, it I, sounds like this was uh, something that was on your mind for a long time. Definitely. So you, and I think the, you, you don't have to. <laughs> the, the thing, I think the thing is, about that's ultimately yeah. it. It's like if if I was to be selling my chocolate bars today, mm. I'd have to be charging minimum six pound fifty for a seventy five gram bar, but more like eight pound fifty for a seventy five gram bar. Now, when you're at that kind of retail price point, so what, what how? How, wow, how and why have the price gone up so much? What's the, what happened there? So, I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of variables within the chocolate industry. The The biggest thing is that the there's not a new generation of farmers going into the industry. So that the, there just is not the supply to meet the demand. Oh. The other thing is that you, you know, traditionally chocolate was eaten in Europe for a very long time. You know, we, we had the highest consumption of chocolate for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And now suddenly in the last 20, all of these international uh, countries have now gone, oh, this is a Western luxury product. We want some. So you had all of these new markets mm -hmm. turning on within a very short space of time and the the supply is actually shrinking. So, you know, demand went absolutely through the roof, supplies dwindling. What then ended up happening was a lot of people got into trading chocolate. So there was actually a guy um, that end, he bought chocolate. So this was around, I think, 2009, 2010. And he bought 
thousands of tons of cocoa beans and burnt them in in Africa, literally setting fire to them to to push the price up of the market. So I think there's there's been a lot of things, oh you know, there's been a lot of things that have happened in that space. And the slave trade in chocolate is a really big issue. Like, it, you know, it's way bigger than people would ever imagine it to be. And so, you know, without naming names, but this is how a lot of the chocolate companies are able to still keep these very low retail price points because they're not really aware or actively aware in understanding where the cocoa came from. So, so this was the problem is our retail price point had to keep creeping up and creeping up and creeping up, and creeping up. And there's only then a smaller and dwindling amount of consumers that are kind of willing to pay seven pound fifty or eight pound fifty for a chocolate bar i've got friends that are still in that space that are doing that but i mean you you're talking about a very small customer market and then to top that all off when i first started selling to selfridges there were about five or six gourmet kind of artisan brands when i left the business there were 85 being sold in just one selfridges store in london so there's a whole bunch of problems in that marketplace, but I think chocolate now as a maker, cool. as an artisan maker is more of a hobby than it is a business. It, it, like you can pay a, a living wage, but it's very lucky that you could do anything beyond that unless you own the whole supply chain, you're growing the beans, you're able to to manufacture them in country and then ship them out and you've got control over the whole thing. Um, they're the only ones that are making really. That's really interesting. Yeah, it sounds to me like there's there's quite a lot of problems with um, with that industry. So, but but again, obviously, problems are great opportunities for uh, people to potentially fix them and and build businesses around them. Um, I remember at some point the just the quality of chocolates in the market generally, even like the standard kind of run of the mill chocolate bars. I remember the, the the quality getting really poor all of a sudden. And, I, and and like, I remember, you know, back, I remember when I was younger and I'd buy even a, a, a Galaxy or a Cadbury bar. Yes, they're the crappy mainstream, whatever. But back in, you know, I remember being young and buying a chocolate bar and it tasted really good. It was like, it tasted like chocolate to me. Maybe I was young and naive and just thought everything tasted amazing. But I'm pretty sure there was a shift at one point. I remember buying chocolate bars a bit later on and then realizing that there's a lot of palm oil that was being introduced to them and so on. So is this all part of the reason why then? So somehow we've had less uh, supply. And so the workaround was, okay, palm oil and whatever else additives you can put in there, plus a bit of non-ethical uh, farming and, and so on. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it to, to be honest, Mo, it, it goes even deeper than that. So actually, um, I, I mean, I, I'm going to name one name, but, you know, C Cabris basically that have had a number of, uh, laws, uh, uh, laws been brought in by the British government to stop them doing certain things. And, and so what Cabris ended up doing way back when, when they first came around, was they started putting pot ash and brick dust and all sorts of other materials into the chocolate because chocolate traditionally was always a very expensive thing. I mean, if you look back to the 1600s when chocolate first really came into you. Me, I've eaten a lot of brick dust and... Yeah. So, you know, the... I'm, I'm not very happy. About that. <laughs> so, you know, Cabris really were a company that, you know, there was this incredibly expensive thing and they said, how do we make it cheaper? How do we make it affordable to the masses? So that, I think this isn't kind of anything new. This has been going on for a very long time. It's just that we have the modern equivalent of that is palm oil and more sugar and less cocoa and all of these other things. So I, I think that the big manufacturers have always been in that game of like how do we take this expensive product this raw material and cheapen it and keep looking at, at ways of, of making it you know more and more inexpensive for for a mass market um but i think as i said before it, it just now has got to the point where the supply isn't there the demand is so high there are so many sort of issues around the product that I got a real sense of this in kind of 2012 and just realized that the chocolate industry had a very bumpy future and, um, you know, made moves to, to get out. Uh, you know, I, I love the industry. It was great. But, um, yeah, I just decided at that point that it, it wasn't going to get me 
where I wanted in in life, and I wasn't going to be able to really change that industry from from the inside out. And I think I also realised that I think when you've done something for you know eleven years, sometimes especially with me, I'm a bit kind of ADHD. I was like, okay, I'm ready for something new. I'm ready for a new challenge. And um, realised that I was sometimes better at growing other people's businesses than than my own. For someone who's uh, who's got a bit of ADHD, uh, actually diagnosed as well uh, at a young age, uh, sticking with one thing for eleven years is is a bloody long time. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that that's probably a, a lot more than what most uh, most of us could do. I mean. I, I sometimes self-diagnose myself with ADHD, uh, completely self-diagnosed, by the way. I, I, don't know, I don't know how true it is. Uh, just because, you know, I can't, I struggle to, maybe I, I want to be involved with different things at different times and so on. So, yeah, so that's, that's, that's can totally understand and, 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 and empathize with that. Um, but yeah, but it sounds to me like there are some issues there around um, farming at the source, really, um, for for the chocolate industry. So, you know, Sounds like there could be something that could be done there potentially, which which could be really interesting. But conversation for another time, I suppose. Um, bring it back then to to the move uh, toward Ikigai. Um, so yeah, so so you realize that working with other businesses is something that you thrive on. You love doing that stuff. You love helping other people, other people business succeed. You obviously became very good at growth hacking. Something naturally you would have had to become a master at anyway from a from from a young age at, in in that business. Sounds to me, to me as well, that the industry itself must have been really tough. And so, how can you way around um, competition and, and different things that are just going on in the business would have been quite, quite a journey. So, you probably would have ran hundreds of experiments and, and if not thousands, and tried to do many, many things. So, yeah. So, I can imagine um, that you probably developed your own models that were just, you know, very unique and, and, and worked really well for you. And translating that over to other businesses makes a lot of sense. So. Um, I want to ask though, why the name uh, Ikigai and whether there's any deeper meaning uh, to, to the concept of Ikigai uh, for you? Sure. So I I can't remember exactly when I first learned about Ikigai. You know, it's pretty early on. I think coming across the concept for the first time, I got very interested, um, I suppose, in my late teens with kind of, I, I, I've always been a bit of a philosophy nerd and I really got interested in Zen Buddhism and so you know did a lot of digging around Zen Buddhism and philosophy and came across the concept of Ikigai which I I think I will admit has been I think somewhat simplified by kind of western culture but the premise of it is is really about finding something that you feel like you don't have to retire from you know, is finding that that thing in life that you just want to jump out of bed and go and do. And so I, I felt that I had that for a while in the chocolate business, not necessarily for the whole time, but there was a good stretch of probably, you know, eight years where I really felt like I was living my my mission. I was getting up every day, excited, enthused, ready to to go and do this thing that I was building. And so that's kind of where this idea first came from. And I realized that actually it syncs up really well with consumer psychology, you know, in the sense that I think people will buy products, but I think what we really want is to buy into something, you know, and I think you see this with a lot of the big brands. They're very clever in cultivating this sort of almost like tribal mentality within their brand that people feel like they belong. And I think a lot of brands probably do that in in a malicious way, um but but i you know I, it was this idea of like helping others to find this purpose and to then help actually use that purpose to grow their business and so i was toying around with the idea of using ikigai as a business i registered a limited company as as that and sort of use the word and terminology a lot in my speaking and growth hacking and then it just kind of culminated to a point where I was like actually I, I, this really syncs up with what I'm doing and what I'm saying and so let's actually turn it into a, a studio and so that that was the kind of thought process but I think it's always been as I said I was lucky to feel that I found my ikigai early on and I think that ikigai for me has has probably changed a little bit over the years but it comes back to a central proverb which is that you know a world becomes great when men uh, men but people plant trees in whose shadow they shall never sit so it's this idea of like 
looking at the world in a way where you're doing something not for you, not even for your children or your generation, but for the continuation of the human species, the planet, the ecosystem. And I think that, you know, I'm a kind of hobbyist gardener. And I think even that starts to teach you that you think in five years or 10 year terms. And I think that not enough businesses are thinking in 100 or 200 year terms, like what what is life going to be like? So I, I think that's my ikigai is about really putting something back, but also helping businesses become more human. That That's really my ikigai. I did it with mine. I really learned that by using consumer psychology and sort of growth hacks, I could really do that using consumer psychology principles. And that, as you said, then I can apply that for others. And, and that feels like it was my ikigai. And, and as I said, I'm kind of helping others figure out what that is and then use that to help them grow. Wow. The concept of um, building for tomorrow it's something that that really resonates with me a lot as well. Uh, the phrase that always sticks with me is that uh, a nation is born stoic and dies epicurean. Um, or in other words, a nation is born by people who do stuff for the future and forsake current pleasures to an extent uh, and, and starts to decline when, when people start to become more YOLO-like, let's say. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I can understand uh, why that moves you, why that gives you uh, passion and a sense of purpose. Um, do you know where that stems from? Do, do you know, cause I've kind of thought about this sometime, like, why is it that I, why is it that I want to build for tomorrow as opposed to just enjoy life now? And why is it that there are people who just want to enjoy life now and don't necessarily care about the future or don't pay as much attention to it? Do, do you know where that comes from for you? Oh, that's a really good question, Mo. I, I really, I really couldn't tell you. I think where it comes from for me. I think that maybe there's an element that I've always been a real nature and animal lover, and I think just inherently, you know, sitting at the age of I don't know seven, eight, you know, watching David Attenborough documentaries on VHS and you know, learning about the natural world. I I, I think there's just this sense that you realize, and I realized really early on that the world needs help, you know, that things are not as it should be. And I think as then life went on, I realized more and more that actually we're we're in a real moment of of decision time, you know, and, and I just felt that it was, wasn't really a choice for me ever. It was more of a duty and, and it's not a duty that I kind of, you know, drag. It's not like a ball and chain duty, but it's just a duty of like, this is something that I need to be doing because this is part of why I'm here. Um, so I, I, it's, it's really hard to say where that came from, but I think that I'm definitely seeing that the more time people spend in nature and simple things like, you know, growing your own food or getting an allotment or it just spending time hiking, you know, bouldering, all of these kind of outdoor pursuit sports. There's just something about being out in nature on a regular basis that just starts to change, I think, your view on it, you know, and, and you start to look at it as, you being part of it, not just this distant thing. You know, it's it's not a, an object or a, an Instagram photo. It's like this is a living, breathing thing that I'm part of. And so I think that identification with other, with, you know, birds, trees, plants, insects, um, and I think ultimately that, you know, it's what all of the spiritual traditions talk about, right, is this separation from the other, whether that be other people by race, creed, money, class, or further than that, you know, nature. It's like there's this idea that we must conquer each other and nature. And I think the more time you spend in nature, you realize that you're never going to conquer it. <laughs> you know, it, it's going to be there long after you're gone and your grandchildren are gone. It will always be there. So I, I think it's, um, yeah, I guess that's it. 
you spend more time in nature and the more you do the more you feel this sort of sense of connection and duty of like actually i should be doing something about this i should be giving back that's really beautiful how do you find time though to do that with all the work and everything you've got going on so i mean a lot of the people um, i speak with here you know, they're all building businesses and, and doing a lot of stuff. So they're constantly running around and busy with this and that and so on. How do you, um, I'm presuming you're no less busy, by the way. I mean, I know, in fact, I know how busy you are because we talked a little bit this week about it. How do you find time to kind of um, find, get get grounded again and, and find and, and be back in nature again? So I, I think for me, there's there's a natural balance and a kind of flow. And I feel like, that's something we lose in the modern world as well is that you know every other mammal tends to hibernate in the winter hunker down get warm eat food and just kind of be in your home environment and then as spring comes they're more active they're getting out they're doing more the days are longer particularly here in the uk we're lucky that you know days are pretty long at the height of summer so i i just kind of feel like for me there's that natural balance of in the winter i'm probably on the laptop more getting more work done and really kind of slamming through work but then as things start to get into spring and into summer I think I just make use of digital nomad life if that makes sense that I you know I've got a really good internet dongle I've got a laptop mm -hmm. I'm lucky that we live in this digital space now where it's easy to work from a location we spend a lot of time in Wales in Snowdonia and I can get on with work, get up early, you know, crack, wow. crack some good work out. And then by half five, I'm swimming in the sea, looking up at a mountain view. So I, I think that there's just this balance, I think, about, you know, maybe making more of the summer, making use of the longer nights. And then just kind of knowing that maybe in winter, you're not going to get as much time outside. You're not going to get as much time in nature. And maybe that's the time to kind of think and plan and strategize for the year ahead. So it's this sort of ebb and flow. And I think that as well, you get that throughout the year. There are times when you need to hunker down and get more work done and do things. But I think that there is always that balance of then trying to find, okay, I've been really busy now for months and months. I've really pushed on these projects I just now need to give myself a little bit of balance back and make sure that I'm disciplined around, you know, my kind of nine to five, um, you know, that there's times, certain days, Fridays where it's like, okay, it's a cut off time. That's it. I'm it's five o'clock. I'm done. I've done my work. Now I need to go and do some me time, get out, do something, get out into nature or go for a swim or, no, or whatever I need it to is. Go and have a conversation with Mo. <laughs> On Friday evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're 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 off to we're off to Snowdonia tomorrow, Mo. So yeah. you're you're excused. You're excused tonight. Is just the packing the packing oh, wow. night, and then tomorrow's the we're we're off to Snowdonia. So there you yeah. Go. Look, you're welcome to start packing while we talk. I'm sure the <laughs> listeners and, and watchers won't mind. Uh, we can, we can see we can see how much uh, how much chocolate you take with you on on those trips uh, from from the old days. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that uh i'm sure some people listening will um might might be a little bit kind of my question why why do that or may not feel the need to go out into in, in nature or sort of uh do that sort of thing you've obviously explained like you know the kind of philosophical side of thing behind it do you find that it helps you on a on a functional practical level as well to kind of uh to go out and, and maybe i'll give a bit of context to this because um so for me personally when i um Every, let's say, year or two, uh, I just find the natural need to go and just take one or two weeks on my own somewhere in nature, in the mountains, or just somewhere where I'm kind of more or less secluded from the day-to-day -day normal aspects of social life. And I find that I always walk away from those experiences having made one or two key decisions about things that are really big or important in my life. Um, and it, it's almost like, a, it, it's both a grounding thing and both maybe like a spiritual thing, but it's also a practical thing in many ways for me where I, I will get to a point when I need to make some big decisions. And if I'm stuck in this normal day-to-day -day environment that I've been in for a long time, it's almost quite hard for me to step outside and look at it and think, okay, well, what's actually going on? Let me look at this whole thing from the outside. So 
for me, I, I also have this kind of like real deep practical reason behind it. Um, and I know that some people listening might not necessarily think they may not, they may not see the practical element of doing this as well. So I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit as well. So that, that's what it's like from my side, but from your point of view, do you also feel like there's, there's that side of it for yourself or is it just more of a kind of spiritual, let me reconnect back with nature? No, definitely Mo, I completely agree with you. So I, I think from a micro point of view, some, something that I try and do as much as I remember is the Pomodoro technique. So you, you probably know it's so cycles of 25 minutes of work, five minutes break, you do four cycles, you take a 25 minute break and then you carry on. On the days that I remember to do it from the minute I start work, I leave that day feeling not so fried, you know, not so burnt out. I kind of leave it thinking, oh, I don't just want to vegetate in a corner staring at the wall for four hours. You know, I'm I'm like, I've still got some... <laughs> You know, I've That's still got some it. faculties left and I and I feel like I could go and have a conversation with somebody. So uh, that's on a kind of micro level of just having a five minute break, standing up, you know, staring out the window, going and doing something, going and making a drink. That's a kind of micro level. And then I think when you look at it at, at the macro of like going out, spending a bit of time in nature or going out for the weekend and doing something different or traveling and visiting a new city at a weekend. All of those sort of things, I think, help to break our default mode network. And it's just about, you know, seeing things differently, experiencing something different, getting out of that pattern that I think a lot of us get into in our lives of you know, Groundhog Day, same thing, same day, especially those of us that work predominantly from home. It's very easy to get into a Groundhog Day kind of feeling. So going and doing something like that, I think just opens up new ways of experiencing and looking at the world. And I just always find, as probably a lot of people do, I never get my best ideas while sitting at a laptop. My best ideas always come in the shower you know, before I'm about to go to sleep, annoyingly, you know, they're, they're happening outside of that, like I'm on the laptop and I'm just kind of punching away at work. And so again, I think going out into nature, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because we've got a friend who's got an Airbnb in Cornwall in a beautiful location, uh, about five minutes from the Eden projects. It's a very good location. And he always says to me that, you know, he, he gets a lot of, I uh, will do, um, you know, he gets a lot of kind of Londoners come down for the weekend or for a week. And he said, it's really interesting because the first day they're kind of uptight. He said, shoulders are up. They're not particularly friendly. They just want to get in the Airbnb and kind of, you know, just, just get unpacked and, you know, whatever. And he said, but you know, yeah, but he said, you know, by day two, day, day three, they've got a smile on their face. Their shoulders are down. They're chatting away. They stop in his garden and have a conversation. So he said, I, I think this is it. It's almost like there can be an annoyance of like, and, and this is where there's a really good book written called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. Very much recommend the book, but it, it talks a lot about this, that, that our Stolen Sorry, Focus stone. by Johan Hari. And it talks a lot about this, that we our focus has been stolen by doing things all the time. And one of the key analogies he uses is he used to look at people on the train who weren't on their way to work and not on their laptop. You know, they're just staring out the window. He used to kind of look at them and go, God, what a waste of time. What are you doing? Just staring out the window at nothing. You should be working. You should be doing something. And so I think there is this pressure subconsciously, consciously that, well, I should be doing something. And I think going out into nature first day isn't always that easy, you know, but, it, but again, by that second day, as you start to get into it, you, you kind of feel everything drop. There's obviously the physiological things that are happening to us in nature. I mean, you know, in Japan, they actually prescribe Shirin Roku forest bathing to people who are suffering from depression or stress. So there's a lot of research that shows that actually spending time in nature rebalances our hormones, blood pressure, all of these things start to happen. So I think it's a culmination of all of that. But I do think it's just if you're struggling, as you said, and you need to find a different perspective or you're looking to make a big decision, it's a really good way to go and do that. It's just spend a bit of time 
out in nature or going and doing something. It could be just traveling to a different city. We were in Paris recently. And while I was walking around, I was having all kinds of new, interesting and strange ideas because it's just, it's a different culture. It's a different language. There's different architecture. It's just, again, breaking that kind of default mode network and, and being in a different space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. There is something that as well, though, um, other than just breaking the network about being in, you know, going up to a huge mountain or staring at the horizon from a, from a beach or, you know, these nature is so grand. Um, and so I was having a chat with a friend of mine the other day and she always likes to analyze things very deeply. Um, she, she's, um, she's a, a researcher. Uh, does a lot of research into philosophy and whatnot and and uh, like academic research and stuff um very interesting person i'll probably have her on here at some point as well but um she always breaks she likes to really deeply analyze things and like you know ask well why is that well why do we feel that way and why is that and why so on which is brilliant she kind of like keeps that you know how children just ask why about everything she's still got that going somehow into adulthood which is brilliant so very curious person um and we were talking about this and she was saying how she th thought about it and she thinks that, you know, one of the main reasons why we have this massive sense of awe when it comes to nature is because it's so large and it encompasses all of your uh, sort of all, all of your vision. Uh, what, what's it called? All of your sight kind of thing it encompasses all of it. And it, it is so large and so big compared to you as a, as kind of like a tiny little thing. And there's something about that that's very awe inducing. Um, I would, I would like to think there's a deeper thing to it than that, of course, but that, but that's one of the things certainly is when you're standing by a, a large waterfall and you can kind of like almost yeah. feel the vibrations of it, uh, or, or by a, by a huge mountain or something like that. It's just, it's incredible. I mean, uh, some of, I remember having real moments of clarity, uh, if you're sitting on top of a mountain in Scotland, I mean, there, there are hills compared to the mountains you get in Europe, of course, if there are people <laughs> listening in here who are not from the UK and have you know, bigger mountains, uh, there, there's still mountains ish, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but I remember having kind of real moments of clarity, uh, when you're so high up and you're just kind of overlooking, uh, looking at the horizon and, and a massive landscape and yeah. So uh, other than simply breaking the, the mode, I think there's something deeper to be said about being specifically in nature as well. Um, but, but yeah, but you also have this, uh, I like to call it the, the tourist tourist mindset when you're in other places, right? Where in, in a positive way, not, not in the tourist, I'm going to, I don't live here. I don't care about this place, but in a, in a kind of, you know, I'm a tourist, so it's okay for me to be a little bit more un, unusual in some way or to be, I, I don't know. I feel like I can be a little bit more silly when I'm a tourist and, and not care as much. I don't know. Very it yeah. But it's in, interesting though. Cause I think, as you say, you know, when you, I mean, it's, it's like into when you meet a new friend group, right? That you get this brief moment to reinvent yourself as, as something slightly different, as a slightly different mm. mask. You know, and I think as humans, we, we wear a lot of different masks. We may wear masks for our friends, wear masks for our partner, our family, that there's these kind of identities that we have. And so, as you say, either nature kind of strips that away, especially when you're on your own, because there is just there is just this great big thing around you. But I think in, in a similar way, when you go somewhere new, it's a new experience, but you get, as you said, that brief moment, that's like, well, nobody knows me here. You know, I, I can be more or slightly more of maybe who I feel like I am or could be or should be. And so I, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you definitely get to explore more of that. The other thing that's interesting is that with nature and with a new place, it pushes you out your comfort zone. There's this sort of moment of like, I'm uncomfortable, you know, even going to Paris, my French isn't that good. My partner's French is a lot better, but there are these moments where you're like, ah, oh, what am I doing? Where am I going? I'm lost. There's a tube station. There's 50 different signs. I'm reading in a different language. You know, there, there's this sort of moment of uncomfortableness that comes from an experience like that, that I just think is really good for us as humans. And I think nature does that as well, that, you know, when you're climbing a mountain or you're in the sea and it's January and when you're doing these things that are just pushing you out your comfort zone, it just reaffirms to you actually that 
you're much more capable than you think you are. And I think that's a really wonderful thing that comes from those kind of experiences as well. Yeah, I used to be very scared of heights uh, and I started climbing trees to try and overcome that fear. And then, and then as I got better and better, I started going up mountains. And I remember I, I still, if I go up something really, really high, uh, I'll still sort of be a, a little bit scared or a little bit kind of shaky, but I, I love it. And, and you're right. You can, once It's crazy how when you prove to yourself you can do it, you can do something, uh, many other things become a lot easier. I remember reading, um, uh, I mean, obviously wouldn't advise this, but I, I wouldn't advise what this man does, David Goggins, because uh, he, he's just, uh, he's a whole other level of of, of pushing himself to, to different limits. Um, but I remember when I was uh, listening to his book, there was a bit in it where he talks about running, um, uh, running a mar- like one of one of these crazy ultra super marathons or whatever that he goes on, um, and he talks about being physically in a lot of pain and and his body is effectively breaking down on him, but he just kind of carries on and keeps running and he's fine and and he's still alive today and you know a, month, a decade later or whatever he's still alive and he's fine. Um, and I remember when I was listening to that and it kind of made me question whether I push myself enough or whether I take enough risks and so on just just because of maybe I'm afraid that I will end up hurting myself or something. Uh, so you're right that, yeah, definitely it, being in, a, in an uncomfortable zone does help you push yourself a lot. And I would imagine that to find your ikigai, you probably need to push yourself outside of your comfort zone to, to kind of discover more of what you can do and learn more I, I think so, Mo. And, and I think one of the things that's interesting is, you know, taking that example. So I, I think I've always tried to push myself uh, you know a lot in in life and i mean i'll give you a little story an anecdote i moved over to mexico for a while i knew that i wasn't going to see i'd spent a lot of time in snowdonia it's a place that's very close to my heart and i went down in an october it was really miserable weather but i was like i'm gonna go because i'm not going to be able to see this place for a, a, a quite a long period of time and i was like right i'm gonna go and i went down to the beach and i'm like I've got to go for a swim. Like it, it's really horrible weather. It's driving rain. It's windy, but I, I've got to get in this water. And you know, I, I'm. And and for those who don't know, by the way, uh, Welsh <laughs> Wales in October. It's not only as in, is in, in Wales, and Wales in October is, no, is not. No, it's not at no. all. So it, yeah, it, a lot of yeah, wind and a lot of rain. And it, so so yeah, yeah. Just to and it was content. probably I don't know three four degrees or some something like that. So it's pretty cold. Seawater is obviously nice and warm in comparison. So, and I'd done a lot of like cold water swimming. So I'm like, okay, I'm fine. I'm good. I can push myself. I'll get in. And so I, I get in. Um, I go and the start swimming. Rain gets heavier. The wind gets heavier. And this huge wave sort of comes up. So I, I dive underneath it. Come up. Another massive wave. Dive underneath that. Another massive wave. Dive underneath that. And so I. I you know, I expect oh, that I've God. traveled probably, I don't know, 10, 15 feet. In reality, I've probably done, I, I don't know, 150 feet. I've been pulled by the current so quickly that I just glance back and realize that I'm very far from the shore. And so I think it's the only time in my life oh, wow. that I ever had that. I don't know whether I'm going to make it out of here. And so I, I start swimming instinct kicks in and I'm just being pummeled by the waves, just one after another, really struggling to breathe. And something in my mind just sort of says, look, stop trying to fight it. Don't try and swim back to the shore. Just kind of swim with the current in kind of a diagonal shape. And there's a, there's a couple of moments where I really felt like no one's on the beach. It's October. It's middle of winter. Nobody's here. If I shout, no one's going to hear me. And I just kind of sat there for a moment in between waves, stared out. This is going to sound like something out of a, 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 mo- a movie, but this little stream of sunshine came through the clouds, just a tiny little stream of sun- sunshine. And I was like, wow. I think I'm going to be OK. So I, I swam back after a good 25 minutes of kind of battling. I just kind of beached up on this rocky bit down way, way down the coast and just kind of lay there for about an hour, just heaving and kind of contemplating life. So I I think that that was a really important lesson for me that I think pushing yourself is good, but not always. 
you know, and I was very lucky that I'm a really strong swimmer anyway. I spent a lot of time in cold water. I've spent a lot of time around strong currents. I knew what to do, but also had a bit of faith that, you know, I was going to kind of make it. So I think sometimes it's, I have found that as I've got, you know, gone through my twenties, it sort of, I think went from an outward searching to an inward searching. And I think that's really where psychology for me was the thing that I really started to use as a tool to kind of delve deeper. And I sort of realized that perhaps sometimes when I am pushing myself too hard, you know, where is that kind of coming from? Is it coming from a place of peace and tranquility and wanting to be at peace and knowing that actually this is a really good thing for me? Or is it coming from a place of I've got to prove something to myself or to the world because there's some deep, dark anxiety or that there's some something that I haven't quite dealt with yet and that there's some inadequacy deep down within me that's sort of telling me to keep pushing and pushing. So I, so I think that really for me, Ikigai, yes, is this like, okay, outward, go and find that thing, search, push yourself, you know, step outside your comfort zone, try different things, but is also the kind of inward work of, and I just check back in to say, well, why am I doing this thing? Why did I feel the need to get into the sea in October in a storm because I felt like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty tough. I can do this. And I'm, you know, proving to myself that nothing stops me, you know. And so I think that there's definitely this sort of inner and outer work that I think as you sort of get a little bit older, you start to realize actually that inner work is really important as well to, to sort of understand why you're doing the things that you're doing and are those things actually really fulfilling you and really making you happy. And I think, I guess that's, that's the real icky guy. The real secret eventually is to kind of crack both of those. It's like the outward expression, but also the inward of like, mm. I'm actually really cool and happy in this place that I'm in doing the thing that I'm doing. And it's bringing me a lot of peace and joy. Um, but I don't feel like I'm, I'm in a battle. I don't feel like every day is that I'm fighting a war. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I love that. There's a, I, I really want to sit and think about that a bit more deeply. The concept of outward searching versus inward searching, um, or, and, and sort of, yeah, outward expression versus, yeah, it, it's a really, it's a really fascinating one. I often get this feeling that, um, I often get this feeling that I'm tired of one or the other or, or not tired, but that, I want it. I, I'd like, you know, I, I often feel like it's kind of like waves or switch between modes. So I sometimes will go into modes where it's just all about outward expression, kind of outward output, essentially get things done, put things out in the world, do more, do more, do more, and not really give much time to sit and reflect with myself or do inward searching as, as you said it. Um, but then I'll find myself kind of getting, getting to a point where I'm like, okay, no, I, I feel like I need to kind of, the wave needs to go the, to the other side now and I need to do a bit more of that. And, and there's less, uh, outward stuff, more inward searching and you kind of come back out of it again, but it's really interesting. Um, what I, I, it sounds to me like intuitively speaking, it sounds to me like what would be incredible is to be in a place where you have both happening simultaneously with a bit more of a regular rhythm rather than being in, in more of a kind of, um, in slightly more of extreme ways, let's call them. But the other thing that I find is that um, I feel like I need less inward time than I do. I don't know how to explain it. As in, as in, I feel like I don't need as much inward searching time as I do outward. I feel more comfortable doing the outward stuff, which probably speaks a lot to the fact that there's stuff to be done inwardly. Um, because, you know, if there's uncomfort around there, that probably means that there's something to be done there. Um, but I think I've just come out of a phase of, of inward searching, let's say. So I think right now I'm kind of moving into the phase of more outward expression. Uh, 
which is yeah really interesting i'm going to think more about this uh i, I love that that way of thinking about it it's a really nice kind of framework thank you, thank you mo i mean I, um, I think it's it's interesting and yeah. like i said when you know when you read a lot of japanese philosophy you know zen philosophy one of the things that's most interesting is some of the greatest minds of zen philosophy zen buddhism poetry they were farmers and so for six seven months a year they're super mm. busy right they're harvesting they're tilling the land they're working there's just all of this activity going on and so they make all of this food and they store it and they ferment it and they do all of these things and then nothing and then there's the weight there's the weight to the spring mm. and so they i think naturally humans you know, before we had the industrial revolution and the way that things have now gone, that humans would have had these times of very high activity and then very low activity because, I mean, there's nothing to do, right? And so I think having this natural balance is really important for us. And I think it can happen in microcosms across the year. You know, certain months yeah. you have high outward, certain months high inward activity. But I definitely think that there's a balance to to be had between them. But I definitely think that if there's an uncomfortableness, it's uh, yeah, as you write, it's like shining a little bit of a light on it and sort of saying, "Well, where's this discomfort coming from?" I should probably at least try and understand where that that feeling comes from. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to challenge that very slightly, uh, but although I think you actually touched on it really well, when, I mean, you mentioned the whole um, micro cycles because uh, the farming analogy is amazing, but that's sure, 10,000 sure. years, right? Uh, of farming, let's say. Um, prior to farming, my hunch is that though that the, the the breaks and a lot of work would have been a lot more of a regular micro thing. Oh yeah, for sure. Thing, for sure. I mean, if that makes sense. So they would have, right. It's like, you know, hunt and then you're good to go for at least. A week sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Compl I mean, I, I still, a lot of the research that's been done on indigenous populations, hunter gatherer populations that are still, or were living very recently still show that they did less overall hours than us actually hunting and gathering but as you say but there's yeah. this more regular rhythm of like they were much more tied to seasonal activity so when things were in season they were out they were prepping they were doing work to collect and ferment and all of those sort of things but as you say that would have been these more micro cosms of like you know big activity rest activity rest and so i think that that's something that you know, it, it, it's obviously inbuilt in us to some extent that, you know, and I think it's at a deeper psychological yeah. level, you know, we all have good days and bad days. And I think we always perceive the bad days as, as the bad ones, mm -hmm. you know, we sort of say, oh, we, we've got to get over this bad thing that's happened, or, you know, I can't wait to be in a different situation. But the bad days always give us context, you know, never more do you realize what you do want when you're in a situation mm -hmm. when you really don't want it. So I think that there's always this balance of like, you know, the yin and the yang, you can't have good without the bad, the bad without the good. Um, and I think it's just being a little bit more comfortable with that. But as you say, Mo, you know, cultivating times where you're balancing both. And I think being around other people that can bring out different aspects of that is really important you know having good friendship groups that you can go and do different experiences with whether it's go and learn kite surfing or go on a hike to somewhere really quiet and, and just be peaceful and have you know a, a deep conversation it's sort of trying to figure out how you can do a little bit of of both of those things to um you know rebalance when we've got one that's lacking yeah absolutely um, and I love, so one thing I started doing fairly recently, and it's been so helpful for me at work, um, in business in in life generally for my health, for everything. So, uh, Andrew Huberman, um, whom, uh, I, I do, I love his podcast. If you haven't uh, heard of, uh, the Huberman lab podcast, highly recommend it. Um, 
obviously not sponsoring <laughs> this at all. Uh, but ho- one one day, one day, hopefully, I'll bring uh, I'll bring Andrew on the podcast here when when we make it uh, when we make it big enough, and then 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 we'll go there and uh, bring him on board. I'm, I'm sure he's building a lot of stuff that's good for profit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but his podcast is amazing, and, and he he gives this workout uh, routine, workout schedule. So. Uh, he basically takes a lot of scientifically backed uh, data from a neurochemical perspective, neurobiological perspective, uh, neuroscience perspective in general, um, and kind of breaks down the science and what studies have found to give us practical tips that we can do in life. Um, and he goes through a whole kind of workout protocol um, that what essentially what he goes through, which is based on a lot of uh, science for just maintaining an optimal kind of level of health, not for any particular health goal or whatever. But one of the things that he incorporates in there um, is doing zone two cardio, cardio for about four or five hours uh, every week on on, on any on a given day. And it coincides very nicely with my love to go and walk in nature. So I've incorporated, incorporated that into my schedule every Sunday. I basically go on a four or five hour hike, uh, just somewhere nice. Um, he so you want to try and be in zone two cardio if you want to get the health benefits as well out of it. But even just doing the, the walk, even if if I'm not in zone two cardio for that walk, it's it's still brilliant. Um, so going for that kind of four or five hour walk is, is incredible. And just one thing I want to highlight for those who are in London uh, and don't think they can find somewhere where they can do that that is nature. It's actually very easy. You can get a train from central London uh, out to somewhere just outside outside of London, Kent or something. Train is like half an hour, 40 minutes, and you can be out in the countryside in no time. Uh, but also, I'm lucky enough to be in East London, and so the canals are right nearby. And you can take the canals all the way up to Epping Forest, which is fab. I just I love that walk. It's incredible. Um, so, yeah, so incorporating that into my weekly schedule has been so good for me in terms of what I'm able, just the, the work that I'm able to do, and, and I can go and think about things that I want to work on and whatnot, but also bring uh, incredible friends uh, out with me who are, uh, who can encourage me to think about things in a different way and so on. So, yeah. Um, so doing that on a more of a micro level once a week for me has been, has been really helpful as well. So totally get that. Do you have any, any ritual like that, uh, where you sort of kind of do it somewhat religiously on a weekly or a monthly basis? I, I, not really, Matt. I think I go through sort of phases of, of the year and do certain things around different times. Um, I, I, I'm, I think probably because of my ADHD, I'm really, I'm not very good at, at super structured routine of doing the same thing, you know, on the mm. same day every week. But I think it's just, you know, as spring comes, I, I'm really pushing myself to to go out into nature as much as possible. You know, I, th- I think that's the thing for me is winter. I allow myself a little bit more introspection and kind of hibernation and just sort of like, OK, this is time to think and be with people and cook and, you know, do, do some kind of more earthly things. And then, you know, spring and summer really is for me like, okay, let's get out there into the world, make the most of it, do some stuff. Um, and I think it's really interesting, like the walking aspect, because one of the things that, and it's a shame they're not really doing them like they used to, but I used to have a friend that organized these big walks up in the Peak District, um, you know, up north of Derby and used to get, you know, sort of 25 to 35 people together who were all of kind of similar interests and interested in nature and sustainability and all doing kinds of weird, interesting and wacky jobs. And it was a really good time to get out, exercise, be with cool people. But also, as you say, you know, learn so much from so many different people, see so many different perspectives. Um, So I, I think it's really important to be able to have those things and I think one thing I will mention for people that again if going out on a hike on your own seems a little bit um, scary there is a group called the travel squad TTS they're on Facebook they're on telegram there's lots of different groups and you can kind of join up and there's groups in the local area all across you know all across the UK uh, and the world so you can kind of join up with people that are just interested in going and doing some hikes and getting out there and doing stuff and so that's a really good way to meet people that are interested in in that sort of thing because um you know i think i said it it's sometimes a little bit scary to go and do these things on your own and if you haven't got friends that are interested in going out hiking and doing these kind of things to the tts is a really good group to go and yeah meet meet some cool people and um 
you know, go on hikes and, and walking routes that you've never done. The other one, uh, I sound like a real uh, old man now, but I've got the um, Ordnance Survey map on my phone, iPhone app. Yeah. Of uh, course. <laughs> uh, it's like two... Qu- <laughs> we, we are, we're oh, definitely. Men, yeah. It's like two quid, but you can literally put in your location or a location and search and of all of the apps in the UK, a lot of them, I think, are, are American um, apps. They don't tend to have a lot of walking routes, but the OS, I mean, if, if I put in my location yeah. here, it'll come up with about 300 different routes. You know, so that's a really good way to just loads of people already set these routes and you can kind of look at them and toggle them by difficulty and time and, and all, all that sort of thing. So that, that's a good good little tip as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I think for the next uh, next time we have you on here, it's going to be done on a walk. Uh, we, we'll need to go on a hike together by the sound of it, and we'll we'll, we'll get the ordnance uh, the ordnance survey uh, OS open and go from there. Um, I was looking at the TTS by the way, <clears throat> and they have a surf squad, which looks very cool. I've been meaning to get into surfing. Actually, it's something I've wanted to do. Uh, for a while um do you surf at all you said you're a strong swimmer uh, yeah in the I cold do, water so i feel like the two do, might do you know what my, where where i spend a lot of time in wales there's not that many good surf beaches and i just never really had uh, friends that wanted to take uh, it up i've actually got my partner i've been wanting to do kite surfing for a while and i've got my first uh sort of lessons booked in this spring so i'm, I'm hoping to take up kite surfing um, I, I like getting out when it's windy and rainy, so it kind of goes goes hand in hand. So hopefully, um, that that's the next thing on the list for me. But um, yeah, I mean, s- surfing would be really cool. Be really cool to go to a place. I'm maybe looking at spending a bit of time in Bali this year, and I know there's some really good surfing out there. So going somewhere like yeah. that, getting into surfing, doing it somewhere where there's kind of consistent good surf, uh, would be really cool. Did you see that breaking of the world record recently? I didn't. No, no. I mean, uh, there's, um, I'm trying to think of the beach. I know probably the beach you're talking about is home to the biggest waves on earth consistently. It's like, uh, they're like yeah. mm, 60 to 80 foot yeah. waves yeah. pretty much consistently. But uh, no, I didn't. I, I had a friend actually who. The, the video is insane. Yeah. I think it's a hundred and something <sighs> foot waves. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'm not sure that's for me personally. Um, I mean, what like? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I can't. I've never tried. Yeah, so it's not for me either. It yeah, would be oh, incredible though. It, it looks scary yeah. as hell, but absolutely um but i you know i think this is it. like I, I had a friend who used to do towing surfing and he did some in portugal and all over the world he's he's passed away actually unfortunately now um not from surfing from wingsuiting mm. but um okay. you know i i think there's yeah oh, you know really? and i wow. think that there's he was one of the most incredible and inspirational guys that that i ever met but uh, but as i said i think that you know it's sometimes as humans we probably do need to check in and ask ourselves why we feel the need of doing these big dangerous things um i mean it's super cool i'm I'm not saying that it's not Mm. and i'm not trying to diminish anybody else i just think that um it's i think it's just good to understand where the drive to do those kind of things comes from but i i yeah i mean i'll start on some smaller waves and see see what happens yeah and then go from there yeah, of course. That's Sorry okay. to hear about That's your friend, okay. by the way. Um, sounds like he went out in style. He but... did, yeah. I mean, he was 21, so he's pretty young. Um, but, you know, very, very interesting guy. It was actually, I got booked to speak at the Singapore Youth Olympic Games. I had no idea that that's what I was doing. I just got booked mm. to do this speaking gig, turned up, got to the kind of conference center, and I got in a lift with a guy who looked like he'd come out of the american military like bold head big big guy and we just kind of looked at each other and and had no idea really what the purpose of this thing was and he looks at me and i'm looking at him and he's like oh what are you doing here and i'm like oh i'm i'm speaking he's like oh yes so am i I said well he's like well what did you do and i said i you know started a chocolate business and blah 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 and he said 
Oh yeah, I started climbing. <laughs> I started climbing mountain, the world's biggest mountains, when I was twelve. He started with Vincent Mastiff in Antarctica when he was twelve, wow. and finished with Everest when he was eighteen. So he's a very, very inspiring guy, and um, definitely one of those people that he'd found his icky guy. You know, his every mission that he went on was about a bigger cause than him. So you know. It wasn't just about him being in the adventure. It was about bringing awareness to to different causes. So, um, yeah, very inspiring guy to know, if but for a short while. And a guy called Johnny Strange, if anyone's interesting. Very cool name and, um, you know, a, a, a fantastic guy. Wow. Well, um, shout out to Johnny uh strange and um yeah we'll we'll try we'll try and get a picture or something there and yeah i mean look inspiring and and the uh, inspiration stays around right and the stories the stories yeah. live on so um so yeah i'll be sure to at least share it with a few people uh who may cool. not yeah well. i mean if if anyone i mean if anyone's interested maybe um, put it in the show notes just there's a couple of youtube videos of him doing consistently mental things that really um just kind of push the boundaries of what humans are capable of doing and uh, a lot of stuff that probably isn't online anymore he had the unofficial world record for car surfing and uh, a world record for downhill mountain boarding wow. i think he got up to 95 miles an hour don't quote me on that mountain boarding downhill in california so um yeah pretty pretty interesting guy so definitely look him up on youtube Thank you, man. Yeah, absolutely, will do. Uh, I've got him here on uh, on on Wikipedia. Uh, looks yeah, like a really nice guy. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's he was. Really, really yeah, I mean, you know, no, I, I'm yeah. still in touch with a couple of people that spoke at the you know Youth Olympic Games, and I think we all just kind of talk and say he was, you know, one of those people that makes a real impression. You know, when you meet them and you just think this guy is way older than his years and is very inspirational. And, you know, a lot of his mm -hmm. talk just centered around your comfort zone. Yeah. You know, it's what we talked about earlier. It's like, he's like your comfort zone is sure. 10 foot mine's, you know, 10,000 feet. And um, it's, it's all about this sort of idea of just yeah. gradually putting yourself more and more out your comfort zone. And, um, you know, it's, again, it's kind of amazing what you can yeah. achieve in life by doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in terms of Ikigai, uh, the, the term has come up quite a few times, not only because obviously you run Ikigai Studio, but because we've been talking about people's Ikigai, uh, but we haven't actually talked about what Ikigai <laughs> Studio do does yet. So <laughs> I, I would love to, to touch on that. I'm sure our listeners would love to hear more as well. Um, and I do love your your illustration of what is Ikigai uh, on your website. Should, could we maybe start there yeah. and move into what you're what you actually? Yeah, do definitely. So I, I think you know Ik Ikigai is this amalgamation of you know the simplistic Western view, which is kind of what we got on the site, is this sort of mixture of what you are good at doing, what the world needs, what you can get paid for. You know, it's it's this sort of amalgamation of different aspects coming together centered with the core which is this purpose piece you know that, that there's, there's a greater purpose and i think that there's this interrelationship between you and what the world needs what you can get paid for and what you're good at so it's this sort of interplay between these different aspects and i think that's you know for businesses it's a good lesson because there's plenty of good ideas out there that no one wants to buy you know there's there's plenty of great products that no one knows about there's plenty of people that overestimate their skills there's plenty of people that underestimate so I, th I think it's about finding that sort of balance and really that's the core of the ikigai principle and so you know i think we help businesses really understand that in a deeper way but you know the way that we relate it back to growth because i think i spent a lot of time hiring creatives working with creatives being a consultant and growth hacker for creative industry businesses, agencies primarily. And one of the things that I really noticed was that they they were very good at talking to their customers' customers, meaning that, uh, you know, an agency would put together a website for a customer 
and sort of then talk to the end customer. So they'd be saying, oh, you know, instead of we do this, we do that. A lot of them are good at saying, you know, this is what we do for you. This is how we help you. This is how we grow your business. But what they were missing, I always felt, was actually the communication to their customer. You know, when they were talking to their customers, they used 50 different uh, acronyms, that you know, abbreviated words, creative fluff. And there's all of this kind of stuff where actually a lot of customers don't really understand what it's for. And so I, over the years of working in the creative space, there's a lot of value there and there's a lot of understanding, especially I think in the top end agencies, which unfortunately most startups or SMEs can't work with. I had the great pleasure of working for a while with a guy called Tim Kobe. And Tim um, helped Steve Jobs set up the Apple retail program for 16 years. And so I worked with Tim. He was a non-exec director wow. on a board. And, you know, we had some really good conversations about consumer psychology and marketing and all of these sort of stuff. And when you realize when somebody of that level is talking about it, that it it's just almost like a completely different level. Um, you know, and I, I asked Tim on one of the calls and said, look, Tim, if you could distill something for me that you learn over your years of doing what you do what would that be and he said information does not change consumer behavior so I said well what does and he said the limbic brain and his kind of comment was you can spend your whole career unpacking that unpacking what that really means that information alone doesn't change consumer behavior and so a lot of companies end up getting in this kind of features and benefits and data and all of that and what he's saying is that that's not what really changes the behavior so that you know these people are functioning at this very high level i think tim charges it's about 850 dollars an hour for for consultation so you get a, yeah Only you get a lot of these you know really big sort of agencies that are doing some great work in the consumer psychology behavioral economics space but what i then started to notice was that agencies that were dealing with kind of SMEs and startups, which has always been my passion, just didn't have that understanding. And they were not applying a lot of those consumer psychology principles. Mm -hmm. So all of that really culminated me going out into the market and saying, A, I'm going to cut the bullshit. I'm going to cut the fluff. I'm going to cut the nonsense because, you know, there's all of this inter-creative terminology and brand and marketing and, you know, all of these different terms that people use. So in Ikigai, we, we get rid of all of that. And it, for us, it really only comes down to acquisition, conversion and retention. That That's the pure, simplistic, you know, view that we have about growing a business is that those three things are a cycle. They each have a role to play. They each need to work together to have sustainable business growth. And so that's really what we work on. And we use consumer psychology to inform our decisions. And I think consumer psychology, you know, Tim explained it better than I can, but I think it's just making businesses more human because ultimately we are dealing with humans. We sell to humans. We work with humans. We really have to start to understand. There's a very good guy that I'm a big fan of called Rory Sutherland. Um, he's got one of the best business books I've ever read called Alchemy. And Rory's got this great quote, which is the mind, the human mind no more runs on logic than a horse runs on petrol. So, it, you know, it's this really good analogy of like, huh. you really have to start to understand what consumers are really tapping into. And I think humans are very good at post rationalizing in logic but actually when the behavior is happening then they're, they're not using logic mm. that's the big mistake that a lot of companies are making is that they're thinking about it as this purely you know economic sense of well this is what ideally people do in an ideal scenario in an ideal world with all information in a in a perfect competitive world well, none of that exists in the real human world you know and mm. so it's really applying that principle we help businesses grow with that but i think for, for all businesses out there i think it's a really important thing to start to really understand what consumer psychology is you know i was very lucky that i met a guy when i was 14 he was wearing a a green trilby hat and it was a networking event and i just kind of thought this guy looks cool i've got to talk to him and i was lucky that at 14 he sort of said to me look 
if you really want to grow and you really want an industry changing business, you have to understand consumer psychology. You have to understand what this stuff really means because you are not Mm. going to persuade somebody to buy your thing over something else by giving them facts and figures. So, you know, it's interesting. All these people have kind of come back to this same very simple principle of being more human, connecting on a more human level. And I think ultimately that's why we've seen such a growth with TikTok is that it is the most human platform we have invented as of yet um i'm not saying that it's going to be because i'm sure there's going to be Hmm. that's a really interesting um because you know when when and even when you look at the change of the influencer space on tiktok you know we, we had instagram influencers perfectly curated images all of these filters there was this kind of period of time where it was about this perfect show reel of a life and now actually some of the biggest influencers on tiktok are the most authentic they're tiktoking in their dressing gown they've come out you know they've been out for a night out they're talking to camera they're just being themselves and so i think that's where really tiktok for me is is that is just it's the most human thing that we've invented as of yet and that's one of the reasons it's it's so popular there's other aspects to it but i think at the core that's really what it does so it's then kind of looking at that and understanding as businesses how can we become more human in our communication in our websites in our decks in our presentations in our everyday communication you know using loom as a tool to communicate versus just emails all of these are little things that we can do to just add that little bit more human touch to things because it it makes a huge difference. We are such incredibly subjective creatures. And, and you know, here's, there's a really good book called Consumerology, and it basically completely... Gosh, I'm, I'm going to have a giant... <laughs> uh, sorry, mate. Um, uh, but, you know... <laughs> I'm not complaining. No, keep and coming, so please. one of the key things that it does is just tears to pieces the consumer research industry because humans are so subjective that it's almost impossible to create a truly uh, objective consumer research study because you know they they did studies they got the same products and they had people go into a darker room and a light room the end result changed. They got people to go into a room that smells nice versus that doesn't smell nice. The results change. Same products, you know, similar groups, randomly chosen, Mm. large uh, control groups. So, you know, cycling through lots of different groups, but comparing the constants, Mm. which was the room changed, the light changed, the smell changed. One had a nice view out to a nice grassy field. The other looked out to an industrial estate. And so if our subjective opinion about a product that we're actually there to be objective about that is the purpose for you to be there in a consumer research study is you're supposed to be objective that's what you're there to do with that in mind the results still changed so imagine what consumers are doing without thinking actively oh i must be super objective in my opinion about this product or that or this service or that they're not thinking that way so this is where brands can manipulate that a lot of brands do you know one of the good examples i make is uh, ford puma versus the range rover evoke virtually the same car different body kit slight few tweaks here and there but ultimately very much the same car Thirty-five thousand pounds minimum difference in between those two cars objectively is the same thing different Mm -hmm. packaging different wrapping but objectively the same car. So if we were making objective decisions, everybody would buy a Ford Puma and not an Evoke. But the reality is that that's not how humans function. Um, You know, if we were objectively logical, we'd all be driving the same car. There'd be three options. It'd be one manufacturer because that would be the most efficient use of, of time and money. Don't have to choose. There's just three cars. There's a small one, a medium one, a large one one manufacturer parts are then mass manufactured for all of them. Everyone's driving the same car, same color. So I I think this is it. When you start to really break it down and go, you know, humans are as far from logic most of the time as, as can possibly be. And so the more we kind of take that on board and understand how do we build in 
more human aspects into our products and services, we start to then unlock this sort of untapped growth that we start to see the light bulb come on. You know, and, and even as as an agency, we studio, we win a lot of work because you know clients go out to tender, so they're they're getting a different agencies and studios to pitch on the same work, and we are consistently winning work because they come back to us and go, wow everybody else just talked about you know colors and websites and fonts and and logos and icon marks and you guys are going we need to have a conversation with you about your acquisition and conversion and this is how this relates to your revenue and your growth so i, th- I think even in our industry we've kind of gone how do we be as human as we can to our customer and that's what they want they want to know if i'm investing in this thing I need to know why. And I need to know that you guys are doing that thought process that you're saying, why is that thing green? Why is it this, this shape? Why does it look like this? Why does the website go from this section to that section that there's, there's a rationale behind it. It's not just picking a pretty color, you know, putting a nice font on and just kind of going, yeah, yeah, cool. There we go. I think it's sort of doing that, you know, rationale and thought process of like, how do we make this, uh, you know, the most humanly applicable thing possible? And how do we get the information across in the way that people are going to remember? And we're thinking about the whole journey and the customer journey, customer experience, UX, UI of, of the whole thing. How do we take people on a journey from, you know, a cold to warm to hot in the most simplistic way? But, you know, it, from a consumer psychology point of view, it's all about building emotion through that cycle you're somebody's coming in with very little emotion and you're looking to build that emotion through that customer journey and experience of like okay i get what this is about i understand um and so the other thing that that does for us is we end up then working for a lot of companies that kind of know this and that they're starting to understand particularly in the tech space a lot of technology is very logically smart very psychologically stupid and that's really something that we've got to start to rectify in a big way. A great way I mean, uh, it. it's not my example, but, you know, Rory Sutherland gives this really good example in his book about satnavs. It says that, you know, satnavs are one of the most psychologically stupid mm-hmm. forms of technology we've ever invented because satnavs have zero context. It's speed mm-hmm. and time. Really, that that's really all that they're looking at. And instead of saying, Okay, you want to go to the airport. Yeah. Why are you going to the airport? Are you catching a flight? Or are you picking somebody up? Because it's a very different thing. If you're catching a flight, mm-hmm. I need to get you there with as the least likelihood of disruption. So it's it's not about the fastest route on average. Yeah. It's what route can I take you on that has the least likelihood of you missing your flight versus you going to pick somebody up. It, it, you know, it's right a, exactly. It's a different well. thing. So yeah. I think this is where we really find that, especially in the tech space, I think a lot of people are starting to think more about this. And I think especially with the advent of AI, you know, even AI tools are kind of helping us, I think, to create technology in a more human way. You know, the way that ChatGPT engages is rather than just call and response, which is kind of what we've got at the moment with Google, you put in some results maybe you'll get what you want, but not necessarily. Whereas now we're actually inventing tools that feel like you're talking to a human being. And so I think it's a really interesting time to be in this yeah. space, but for, for I think all business owners to be thinking more about the yeah. the psychology of, you know, how do we make our products psychological rather than just logical? I like that a lot. Uh, and a, another another little line there. Uh, I love that. So, so much to unpack. I mean, uh, first of all, you're making me very much want to say, "Can we hire you and, and work with you?" Uh, but but uh, it, it is it is really interesting, and and I think it's it, it's just quite tough. It's one of those things where when you're in a startup environment, um, there's so much going on uh, when when you're founding a business at the start that. that this branding, marketing, consumer psychology side of things almost comes as a, as a second thought in many ways. Um, you, 
there's an there's an understanding there's a deep sense of we need to make sure we build something that customers really want and we also need to make sure that we can actually get it in front of them through the channels that they use and to speak the language that they speak but i feel like a lot of it ends up being somewhat lip service when you're in the trenches because there's so much going on and there's so so many things you can focus on and do at any given point in time so how do you first of all how do startups realize the importance of this but also at what stage would you say that you know it's most useful to think about this stuff um and then sort of as as a kind of a mini tangent on that um are all startups built equal in that sense? Do all startups need to go through this stuff at the same stage or does it come at different stages for different companies? So I, I would say that it is really critical to get it right from the beginning because one of the biggest problems that I see is that, you know, the, there's two examples, two different companies we're working with at the moment. One is, a, I mean, they're, they're pre-seed. So they're, they're very much at the very early front of their journey and they've, you know, shown this documentation, website, uh, two, you know, one pages, pitch decks. I don't have a clue what they do and what they offer. Not the foggiest. And then there's another tech company that we're, we're working with at the moment that have been around for five years. Same situation. Websites, pitch decks. I'm like, I don't know what you guys do. Not a clue. And so I think the, you know, and the company that have been around for five years, their message, you know, their, their thing to us is they're saying, we get in front of good people, we're getting in front of decision makers, and we just, we're just not closing the deals. So I, I think they've been doing that for four years, you know, banging their head against a wall going, what on earth is going on? We've got this great product. It's really smart. It's this, it's that, it, you know, we've, we've, we think we've got everything right the piece that's missing is the communication to the customer. And so it, it, I, I, it's a really simple analogy, but you go to a restaurant, you're presented with two bottles of wine. One of them's in a beautiful bottle. The other one's in a, a, a an orangina uh, carton, but with a, with a label slapped over it. You know, <laughs> arguably they could be both exactly the same quality of wine. Yeah. You're never, ever going to buy, you know, yeah, you're never going to buy the wine in an orangina carton. It's just, it's not going to happen. So I think it's really important to get it right from the start because I think that I see a lot of startups fail quick because they don't get that piece right, is that they go out to market, great product. And, I, you know, I see it from an F&B point of view. I have tried some world-stoppingly good F&B products in really crap packaging and they've never worked. And so it, it's no different in the tech space that that, you know, and, and I liken it to I'm a qualified PT and nutritionist. As a side note, that's a whole different conversation. But I, <laughs> I, I saw that and I, yeah, I, I didn't want to bring that up. What, yeah. <laughs> what, I, what was interesting is, you know, I spent quite a bit of time in gyms. I had some clients that I was kind of hobbyist training just to get, um, I suppose, get knowledge out of here and into a way that people can practically understand. It's not something I do as as a you know, revenue source, it's really just a hobby for me. So one of the things I noticed was the PTs with the most clients didn't necessarily know what they were talking about. They looked the best and they had the most confidence. The PTs who actually people should be hiring uh, didn't always look as polished and certainly were not as confident. And so I think this is the thing that sometimes in in business, it's not always about having this perfect product and perfect uh, thought through process it's actually the human piece that sometimes is more important if you know how to effectively communicate and you can mm. package it up in the right way you can sell more than you'd ever imagine i mean if you look at some really successful tech companies in silicon valley if you look at their pitch decks they were dreadful but the one thing that they were is just really clear this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we fit into the marketplace. This is how much money we need. And you're much more likely to get investment on that versus a 29 page pitch deck that I need to sit down on a Sunday and cross out my entire day to get through and try and understand what you're, you're telling me. 
So I think that communication is really critical to get mm. right early on, because if you can, the, the kind of the product and the service doesn't necessarily need to be even that good. I think it's the communication piece that's key. We see this all the time, the amount of kind of products that get sold online that when you really analyze what they are, it's just clever psychology. If Supreme can sell people a house brick with a logo on it, I mean, you, you can sell anything as long. I'm. Uh, don't get I mean, started. I. It's yeah. You're, 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 I don't agree right. with that. I yeah. think that that's kind of manipulation marketing. It's not a good thing to be doing. But what I'm saying is that you know, when you look at brands that really harness that it, psychology, it, yeah. it's amazing what they can do with it. So amazing what you can do positively if you harness that Absolutely. same psychology and sort of understand. We need to get this customer communication piece really right and if we can do that and it kind of unlocks so much growth and you end up rather than the biggest problem that i see for startups smes you know even smes that have been around for a long time you know i've worked with smes that have been around for 35 years and they still get zero inbound traffic everything they do is outbound you know versus companies that have been around six months that understand psychology 80% of what they're doing is inbound. And I think that's the kind of the magic balance that starts to happen yeah. is when you start to switch, wow. you know, that, inbound to huge. outbound, yeah. everything changes. Because when people are knocking on your door going, hey, we'd really like to work with you. We've seen your thing. We're aware of what you do. We've read your information, really resonated with us. And people, you have to listen for the language. You know, people will start to say things like that. They'll use mm. emotional tonation language. They'll say, I really like your website. I re I, it, your website made me smile. It's really funny. It's really to the point. I really get it. It really resonates with me. And so actually you're kind of looking for that emotional language because if you, if you can do that, then you're already 10 steps ahead of your competition because they're just kind of looking at, oh, well, we just need to take people down a funnel, A to B to C to D, give them the you know, product price. Uh, I mean, that's not really it. You're, you want people to be emotionally connected to what you do. Otherwise, really, the, you are always going to be in a solely outbound point of view. You're always going to be transactional. Mm. And, you know, as soon as you stop advertising, as soon as you stop doing that outreach, the, the business is going to flatline and you don't want to be in that position. So I think it's important to get it right. Of course, not everyone does. So I think at any point in your journey, if you can stop at some point, regroup and kind of say, okay, if things are not working that well, you know, and I always say to people, you need to understand psychology if you're business isn't exactly where you want it to be and you've got more than enough customers. If you've got more than enough customers, dude, carry on what you're doing. You don't you don't need to really think about that. But if you don't have enough customers, if you're not converting and you're not retaining, then you really need to understand this better because only through doing that will you then get the results that you kind of want. Yeah, absolutely. AKA you need to take the red pill because it's scary to, to face the truth. Uh, I think, I think in many ways as well, maybe the decision there, cause I, I mean, from experience in the past, when things haven't worked so well, it can be very scary to, it, it can be scary to ask for genuine advice or to ask an expert, you know, what is actually going on? Because it's almost like, you know, the answer. And it, but you don't yeah. want to hear it from somebody else. Mm. Going to be like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, yeah sure, right? sure. <laughs> um, and that can be a very scary thing. So, so I feel like that also might be some one of the reasons why that you know founders may not necessarily uh, go after things like that sometimes. But of course, that you, you have to be honest with yourself and uh, yeah. face the harsh truths. Yeah, or, you, or you don't, and somebody else can learn from your mistake. You know, and and I I know that's <laughs> you know, but but yeah, uh, you know, I kind of been around long enough to see enough businesses come and go that. Um, you know, people that don't listen, they, they usually learn second time round. You know, when, once they've had a, a failed business or two, they then start to go, okay, mm, something's not quite working here. Something's not quite right. And I think ultimately that's just something that all founders, I think, are in somewhat a battle of is this kind of internal ego piece um, that, you know, 
as we're younger as well. I think we feel like we've got more figured out than we do. We vastly overestimate our knowledge and experience. And I think as you get that little bit older and a bit more experienced, you, you then get to that point of going, oh my God, I know nothing. I really just, I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm on bar three of the monkey bars at school. Like I'm really just getting going. And I think just by reminding yourself sometimes of like, mm. To, to be a bit more humble and to, to, I think, just ground yourself sometimes. It's like, do you really think you've got it all figured out? You know, do you really think that your two, three, five, six, ten years is equivalent to somebody else's 50? You know, and I think that was a really good lesson for me to learn early on. I had a couple of really good mentors really dress me down, you know, make me look like a complete fool in front of them in a you know in a couple of quite important situations and that was really a, a good thing for me i think to realize like wow mm. there's there's a lot for me to learn um and i think this is it the more you go on that kind of learning experience the more you realize what you don't know um i think that there is there you know yeah. taking advice from just anyone isn't necessarily a good thing and i think you've got to be very discerning in who you decide to to go to, but I think it's just it's important to to know that you can learn a lot from almost anybody. That you know, so many people in your life can become a teacher and give you a different perspective if you're willing to hear it. Um, and sometimes it's not even the perspective they give you; it's kind of what's underneath that. You're sort of saying, "Okay, well, where's where's this coming from? Is it a place of?" you know, do they want to help me? Is there an agenda? Is that what, where's, where's this kind of coming from? So I think you have to understand and analyze that, but I think it is just important to take on board things. And especially, you know, and I've seen it a lot with founders, two or three people are banging the door, telling them the same thing. I come along and they sort of say, oh yeah, we've had a few people say this. It's probably a good sign that you should listen. Some founders do, some founders don't, you know, but I think that's it. If, if you've got multiple people telling you the same thing or one of the other things that's that's really critical to look out for is that if people are sort of saying something's not quite right or it's not quite working or I'm not quite resonating, they might not be able to explain it because I think that's one of the really interesting things with psychology is we don't always, we can't always post-rationalize like exactly why we've done a certain thing or why something might not be what they're looking for. But that's also a good indicator to kind of say, okay, there's something not quite right here. So maybe we should go on a journey to to find out. Um, and I think if if anything has been my superpower in business ab above anything else is I've just always had a mentality of I'll figure it out. Uh, whatever it is, I'll figure it out. Mm. In software, coding a website, whatever it is, you know, throughout my journey, I've always been like, I'll figure it out. It's okay, you know. I'll, I'll figure out some way, and that started out uh, showing my age here, but like literally renting books from a library, you know, when I very first started. But now is like you know giving that time to kind of learn wow. and develop and and you know change the way that I look at things and kind of evolve constantly. And I think if you have that mentality of I'll figure it out, I'll find a way, then I really think that you can do more than you'd ever imagine you know that you are uh yeah su success is never going to say guaranteed but it's as close to guaranteed as you're ever going to get with an attitude like that you know and i think i i've just learned that from really successful people that i've met that just have that like i'll figure it out i'll learn uh, you know i'm not gonna come up with 50 reasons why not and 50 reasons why i can't first i'm gonna learn over time to just have that attitude mm. of like okay i've got a new client they've asked me to look at a new piece of software haven't got a clue i'll figure it out i'll go youtube find out um you know and, and a good example of that i think is it can really benefit your personal life is i've got an old 2004 subaru impreza they're pretty tricky to fix and find parts for and stuff and i got very irritated with keep going to mechanics and I then taught myself how to work on cars, been doing it for a few years. There's kind of most things that I'll attempt now. But I think it was just that attitude of like, this is a real pain for me. So I'll just go and figure it out. This is it. I'll go on YouTube. I'll get books. I'll listen to podcasts and I'll figure it out at some point. Um, and now, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident to get the car up and do most of the work that I need to do on it.
That's brilliant. Wow. Very inspiring, my friend. Um, love the attitude of I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, easier said sure, than done sure. sometimes. Um, I like to think that, you know, I like to think that I have that mindset, but if I'm being totally honest, I've definitely been in places where just things aren't working out and I don't know why, or I do know why, and I don't know how to fix it or, or whatever or something along the lines. And that can just kind of weigh down quite heavily on, uh, on me sometimes. And I'd like to think that I'm always going to be like, yep, I'll figure it out. It'll be fine. I'm going to go and find a way around it. Sometimes, sometimes I don't see that straight away. Like I like to have the mindset. Uh, that, that that's there but sometimes it takes a little bit of time of kind of dealing with the uncertainty or, or or the feeling that comes with that and then be like okay all right well let's go and figure this out kind of thing so easier said than done but certainly gets easier yeah practice, sure sure right? and the more you practice the 100 percent. Do, do you do you have a a certain do you have a certain go-to because like my my go-to with that and i now i know i've learned spot it by the way I've learned the spot when I'm feeling well, I've learned the spot, what happens to me emotionally when there is something that I'm deeply uncertain about and there is something that needs fixing or needs, but well, where something is not going right, it needs work essentially um, in business that is. And I've learned to spot what the patterns look like for me emotionally. So now I can be like, okay, well, that means there's something there. Let me go and figure out what's going on. Right. And for me, one key thing is a whiteboard and a, and a marker. I just, just, I, I have a, I'll just go by a whiteboard and get a marker in my hand and just map everything out and my thoughts and what's going on and the problem and blah, 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 and think of different solutions and so on and go and implement stuff. That that's been my way of doing this. And it works for me every time. Is there something like that for you that you'd recommend for people like a methodology? Um, so I use? think, I think Mo, there's, 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 I think lots of different ways as, as that kind of end methodology to, to put it into practice. I do think that doing you know writing something out is a really good way to do that whether it's a notebook whether it's a whiteboard whether it's notion whether it's a mind map whatever that sort of tool is that you feel most drawn to i think is a really good thing but uh, you know creating something and i think that's one of the things that you know humans if you end up creating something you can kind of look at it and go, oh, I've, I've just written this, or I've just planned this out. But I think you, you absolutely right, picked up there kind of before that happens, that this is where the psychology piece is really important for me, this sort of inward looking, recognizing those patterns. And I think it's, it's super interesting, the more you unpick your own psychology, there's a really good book that I'd recommend to a lot of people, uh, written by a lady called uh, Nicole Perler, and she is known online as the holistic psychologist and she wrote a really good book called how to do the work so you know there's a lot a lot a lot of practical advice in there journaling notebooking there's lots of different exercises she teaches you and i think out of all i mean i could recommend 100 good psychology books but i would say the thing that they lack in is the practical application of a methodology that sort of takes you into something but i think the understanding of it is really important because we have a lot of patterns that we've developed from childhood so whether that's from trauma and i'm not talking about big t as they call it in psychology the big t you know abuse yeah, yeah, sexual course. physical that kind of thing but small t so like little trauma which could be you know your mom uh, denying your feelings over a period of time at a certain age it could be bullying at school it could be a parent was absent for a period of time through your childhood you know all of these things are little traumas and I think one of the things that Nicole's book is so good at doing is starting to unpick and unpeel the onion where you then start to go ah okay, the reason why this is such an issue for me is because I've got this unconscious triggering and behavior, learnt behavior that I've got, that this thing is pushing those buttons from the past. And so, you know, I've come to recognize mm. I've picked up a lot of, you know, issues and emotional dysregulation from family close family from the past and it's i'm not i'm not pointing any fingers by the way i'm not saying it's their fault but it's sort of multi no, 
generational it's passed on from kind of family to family and so by kind of recognizing these things i think it's really important because then you you start to observe behavior and you, you pointed that out just just now mo that you start to observe these behavioral patterns kind of playing out and over time and practice you start to spot them as they're rolling and go ah here it goes again i'm doing this thing that i do and as you start to unravel and unpick, you start to recognize like, ah, this is something that obviously I need to unravel and, and kind of work on. And so, you know, Nicole's really good at giving you lots of different ways. The primary way that she does it is called future self journaling. You can Google it on a website, you can download templates. And it's basically just this constant practice of writing to your future self, you know, and talking about the behavior that you're observing where you think it comes from she gives lots of exercises on how to start to unravel and unpick but then ultimately the final point is like where do i want to be because i i don't necessarily want this behavioral pattern to keep mm. kicking in one of the things that i learned from close family was i was not very good at regulating certain types of emotion so i so i'd kind of go from zero to a hundred mm. very quickly and it's almost like this subconscious reaction that I, even afterwards i'd be thinking wow i really overreacted at that what on earth why why did that mm. insignificant thing drive me crazy and so those sort of things over time as that feeling is starting to rise you're like oh, okay here we go it's kicking in again somebody's pushed that old wound somebody's pushed that button and now i'm i'm mm. then losing my emotional regulation so I think that's a really good practice to get into is sort of finding ways of digging deep, looking at these emotional reactions. And then, as I said, whatever you're drawn to, if it's whiteboarding, if it's journaling, if it's writing it down on Notion. But I think getting thoughts out is a really important thing. And, and I think probably my best way of doing that is actually talking about it. I'm a... I'm a waffler by trade. It's what I do. You know, I, I speak a lot for, for my living. So I think for me, one of the, the big things is finding a good friend and being able to kind of talk things through. That's kind of how I most deal with, with what's going on and just talking about what's going on at that time, what's yeah. not working. And it's quite interesting that even if somebody's just listening, you'll kind of usually talk yourself into some kind of solution. And then the end of the conversation go, oh, yeah. Yeah, I probably should do that. You know, and your friends going, yeah, yeah, you probably should. You know, so um, that that's that's my 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 solving of that is mostly through talking. But it's the bit before that I think is worth doing the work. And I think in your professional life, it's super important as well. You know, if if you can start to deal with these unconscious programs that we've developed and picked up. Um, it's so beneficial when you're running a company because you're, you're just not as reactive and you start to understand where you've got room for improvement, work, improvement, and, you know, working with other people. This is this sort of human element that we all work with people, right? Whether they're clients or whether they're employees is we're surrounded by people all the time. So we first need to understand ourselves a little bit better, but then understanding them is, is part of that journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, managing other people also can make you realize a lot of things sometimes uh, when you start working, when you, if you lead a company and you hire people and you manage people and so on, and you work with others, um, a lot of those things can come up. Uh, if, if you've had some sort of tough times in childhood or, or whatever, uh, those things can show up in, in many ways. And sometimes unconsciously, sometimes consciously. Um, and, and definitely like one thing that I've noticed is that I felt I'm able to be closer to my team when I started doing work on myself, uh, which is, which was really, really, which was really nice. Uh, cause you're able to connect more deeply with your team and, uh, and it just means you're going to just work better as a, as a company as a whole. Uh, but also you, you, you bang on hit it there on the head when he said, uh, hit the nail on the head when he said, um, with, your relationship with with business in general, um, yeah, I think one really important thing for for us to look out for is you know when something isn't quite working and and we can spot the same pattern happen again and again, that usually means there's something there that really needs work or really needs to be done. And sometimes it's not just about a practical piece of knowledge that you need to learn or a strategy or finance or whatever. 
sometimes it's deeper than that and and it means working on on the self which can be a tough journey i suppose um but yeah dude we <laughs> i could go on for hours um we've touched on so many things here um i loved when we talked about the the ego battle as well when we're talking about founders and taking advice and listening to people and um you're very right you know you don't ask i know it's such a cliche thing to say but almost you know don't ask your poor neighbor how to how to get rich uh or don't ask a uh, i don't know don't ask someone who can't swim yeah. how to swim yeah sure thing, right um so in that in that sense when it comes to taking advice from others uh, but now I know I'm coming to you for <laughs> swimming advice because if you uh, if you survive that, then I'm, I'm sure you can teach me a thing or two there. Um, I guess what, one last thing I'd want to say. Um, so Ikigai, the the work that you do in helping founders and um, helping companies, startups. So you mentioned you can you work with junk companies generally at any sort of level. Um, if people want to check out uh, Ikigai and and potentially want to like the sound of what you're doing and potentially want to work with you. Is it pretty as simple as going to the website? Yeah, sure. Go to website. the website, go to LinkedIn, you know, and, and I think I, I, on, honestly, and, and this is not just one of those flippant, flippant things that people say, but, I, you know, I, I really, I want to help people as much as I can. I'm always up for having a call and a chat with somebody. Um, you know, if you're not our right client, I'll be honest with you, but but I'm always willing to help somebody. And I think one of the biggest things that I notice is that I meet, an awful lot of people um, of all different ages and companies, students, all, all sorts of different people and walks of life. And one of the things that I've noticed is that I have told people, you know, probably millions of people by now, every time I get on a stage, every time I do a speech, I'll always say, please get in touch with me, reach out on social, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm always around for a chat. And I would say probably less than 1% of people that I say that to either indirectly in, in a speech or even face to face after the speech. And I'm looking at them going, drop me a line, get in touch. Cause you know, keep me up to date with what you've got going on. I'd love to give you a bit of advice that, that such a tiny percentage actually do. So I, I'd say get in touch. I'm always happy to help. Um, if I can find time to have a conversation with you, I, I certainly will. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Louis. Um, I know you've got a pack because uh, you're traveling, so don't want to keep you. I, I would love to keep you for longer, but I think uh, I won't keep you for longer because I know that you've got stuff planned. But uh, my friend, best of luck with everything that you're doing. You're a, you're a beautiful human being, and it was thanks. really, really nice speaking with you. Um, thanks for being so open about everything. You've been on, on an incredible journey as well, by the sound of it. Um, and I'm just yeah looking forward to keeping in touch and uh, hopefully having another conversation like awesome. this. Thanks so much, Mo. Really, really good to be here. We hope that you liked the episode. This podcast was sponsored by QFind, a hiring platform that matches candidates with jobs and employers based on many factors that ensure longer term alignment. It goes way beyond package and salaries and take into account much, much more than that to ensure a happy uh, working environment for everybody. To find out more about this podcast and to see further releases, we'll be announcing them at the at QFinds.io uh, Instagram page, as well as on the QFinds.io website, as well as from my own personal uh, Instagram page and my own personal LinkedIn. All information you need that we spoke about in the podcast or this information mentioned here will be mentioned below in the description. So take a look, visit those links, and if you like anything or want to get in touch, uh, please do. And lastly, stay tuned for more. Have an amazing week ahead of you.